Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar. This is part of the Quality Healthcare for Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, and Transgender People, a four-part webinar series. This is an encore of our part two presentation, Creating a Welcoming and Safe Environment for LGBT People and Families. Before we go any further, I want to make sure everyone can hear me. If so, can you please click to raise your hand in the control panel? Very good. Thank you very much. So we're going to go ahead and get started. Nathan, next slide, please. Great. So a few general housekeeping rules. If you do experience any technical difficulties during the webinar, meaning there's a problem with your audio or you are unable to view the slides, please contact GoToMeeting.com customer support. We do have a corporate account, so that would be option one. The telephone numbers are listed here. And I also wanted to let everyone know that the webinar slides, so the PowerPoint slides will be posted to our respective websites after the webinar. Give us 24 to 48 hours. And we are recording this webinar, so the recording will also be available as well. Next slide, please. So I wanted to tell you a little bit about our center. I am with the Hopkins Center for Health Disparity Solutions, which is a research center within the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. We are funded by the National Institutes of Health, National Institute on Minority Health and Health Disparities. We were founded in 2002 by Dr. Thomas Leviste, and we have been designated a National Center of Excellence. We are very pleased to report that we received earlier this year our third five-year grant cycle of funding. Next slide, please. And we're very pleased that we have an assessment tool that also incorporates the diversity of the population we're talking about today, the LGBTQ community. In our Cultural Competency Organizational Assessment 360, or COA 360, we take a very broad view of diversity and we look at race, ethnicity, language, religion or spirituality, gender identity, as well as sexual identity. In addition, we've received permission to incorporate the Human Rights Campaign Healthcare Equality Index Core 4 into our assessment tool as well. Next slide, please. And then lastly, one of the co-sponsors of today's webinar is the Culture Equality Collaborative, which is a network of hospitals that is working to improve their organizational cultural competency efforts. Next slide. And now I would like to turn it over to my colleague, Amy wilson Strunk. Thank you so much, Sheree, and welcome, everybody. I'm so thrilled to be able to participate in this encore presentation. Um, I want to share a little bit of uh, I am proud to serve as a board member of GLAMA's Board of Directors and also co-chair of uh, GLAMA's Education Committee. Um, GLAMA's mission is to ensure that equality in health care is there for lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender individuals and health care providers. We work in advocacy, policy, education, and research. GLAMA supports efforts to raise awareness of the healthcare needs of LGBT people and families, and we work to create programs to support these needs, such as this educational program. Um, additionally, GLAMA maintains the provider directory of LGBT-friendly healthcare professionals. We have flyers listing the top 10 things that LGBT people should discuss with their healthcare providers. And we'll be releasing the highly anticipated paper, Recommendations for LGBT Equity and Inclusion in Healthcare Professionals Education. So we're really doing a lot of work to really advance health equity for the LGBT population. Um, I, also I would like to also invite you to um, participate in GLAMA's educational conference. We have an annual educational event. Next year's conference is going to be held in Denver, Colorado, September 18th through 21st. So if you are enjoying the information that you get from this webinar, I think you'll also be very, very excited to learn everything that is available educationally um, at our conference. So um, I'd also just like to put in one additional plug for membership in, in the Gay and Lesbian Medical Association. 
GLAMA is a membership organization that's open to anyone who's interested in advancing health equity for LGBT people. Um, our membership includes physicians, but we also include nurses, policymakers, researchers, advocates, and others who are working to improve health equity. Basically, any myths that we are only gay physicians are false, and we even have straight non-clinicians who are members. So please consider joining us as we work together to advance health equity and culturally competent care. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Nathan Levitt, our uh, presenter. Nathan did a wonderful job presenting this content last month, and it was so successful that we thought we'd better offer it again. So Nathan Levitt is a community outreach and education nurse for Cal and Lord Community Health Center in New York City, and he is also a practicing oncology nurse at Memonides Medical Center in Brooklyn, and I am sorry, I cannot pronounce that. <laughs> Nathan speaks frequently with a variety of audiences about how to better serve the LGBT community and create a more welcoming environment. So please join me in welcoming Nathan. Thank you, Nathan. Thank you so much. I'm going to imagine that there's a lot of applause. I can't hear it. But um, I'm looking forward to this presentation. I have presented it, as was said, last month, and I look forward to presenting it again. And I also look forward to the uh, questions and participation at the end. So just to start, I just want to go over some learning objectives. So these are the objectives of which we're going to cover today. So hopefully by the end of the webinar, you'll be able to describe the barriers faced by lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender people in accessing healthcare, and also why these barriers exist. I'm going to focus a lot on barriers because I think it's really helpful in order to create a welcoming environment that you understand what the barriers are that this community faces. And also being able to identify concrete tools to incorporate into your school, organization, hospital, or healthcare center to provide sensitive, affirming, informed, and empowering healthcare for the LGBT community. So no matter where you're working, uh, hopefully you'll get tools from this webinar that'll help you. And some of the agenda of what I'm going to be going over, just so you have a, a sense of where we're going in the presentation. First, again, I'm focusing on the barriers and health risks, talking about definitions. So for some people, this might be a review. You might already know the definitions within the LGBT community, but for others, it might be new. And I would say for people that have uh, you know, experienced these definitions before, that it's helpful to learn them again and also to help in teaching them to other people in your organization, in your health center or hospital. We're going to go over the barriers and health risks, and specifically, we're going to focus on transgender individuals and community, youth, and older adults. And this is because these are three categories that often get left out of a discussion around uh, LGBT health. We don't focus enough, and we don't have as much information. So I'm going to try to focus more on, the, on those populations. And then uh, towards the end, I'm going to talk a lot about how to integrate strategies. So now that you know all the barriers and health risks, how to focus on integrating strategies within uh, different places. So looking at the environment, looking at policies, looking at trainings, and evaluation. So checking in, we're going to start with a poll. Um, right. I think Ch Jerry is going to take over on this one. Yes. So we, our first question is, have you had any previous training or experience with LGBT health? And please se select one of the following, yes or no. We still have a few more people voting. I'll give you another five seconds. Great. So basically 55% of people said yes, they had received previous training or experience with LGBT health, with 45% stating no. Let's go on to our next poll question. And that question is, is LGBT health included in your curriculum and or practice? Again, please select one of the following, yes or no. Okay. 
And here we have 57% stating yes and 43% stating no. And our last question is, how equipped do you feel right now to address LGBT health concerns? Please select one of the following, not at all, a little, somewhat, or well equipped. So 12% stated not at all, 23% stated a little, 39% stated somewhat, and 26% stated well-equipped. And I will go ahead and turn it back over to Nathan. Great. Thank you so much. So that's actually how I like to start presentations. I, I do presentations for hospitals, health centers, uh, schools, other organizations, and it gives you a sense of you know who's in the room. Um, who is, what kind of experience people have had. And I've noticed that, you know, there are a lot of places, especially around schools, like nursing schools, medical schools, social work school, don't have curriculum that includes LGBT health. And we know that that's going to produce, you know, uninformed providers. And often you might have curriculum, but you don't necessarily feel like you could address right now LGBT health concerns. So that sort of gives you a sense to kind of think about that. And hopefully by the end of this presentation, you will feel more equipped, but again, this is, this is an ongoing process, so it's always, you know, about educating yourself continually. So I'm going to get started with the next slide. So this is sort of a setup of how I think about creating a welcoming environment, and you'll see that there are arrows throughout this chart. So this isn't you go through it one time, the cycle, and then you're ready to go. It's a, it's a continual process of how to create a welcoming environment for the LGBT community. So starting off, what we're going to do today is understand barriers and health risks. As I said before, this is a really integral part in creating a welcoming environment. When someone comes into your center, you want to understand what kind of challenges they faced, even maybe before they even came in the door. Community connection. So having a connection to the community, being connected to the LGBT community, uh, being connected to community resources, knowing what's out there in the community. Education and training, so you know, being able to educate your staff, uh, the hospital staff, health center, within schools, students, professors, education and training on LGBT health, and you know, ongoing throughout the curriculum, throughout the health center, throughout staff orientation, things like that. And then integrating strategies, so now that you've gotten this education and training, how will you integrate it specifically into the place that you work? And evaluation, evaluation is very important, being able to evaluate how it went when you did the training, how it went with your uh, patients, with your staff. Do they feel like they understand the issues that are going on? Do patients feel comfortable in your center or in your health center or your hospital? So I'm going to talk specifically about all of these things in creating a welcoming environment. So why is this important? I know a lot of you on the um, webinar today know that it's important and that's why you're here, but some of the reasons why it's important is a lot of LGBT people are in need of social services, medical care, and just basic access to employment and housing. And they face many barriers, and a lot of the barriers I'm going to go over today include discrimination, ignorance, poverty, prejudice, and fear. Many LGBT people, especially transgender people, avoid care for preventative and urgent life-threatening conditions, and that's because of the discrimination and fear that people face. And lastly, there are very few health providers and hospitals in the country that have supportive and sensitive health services for LGBT people. And we know this at Cal and Lord, where I work, because uh, you know, Cal and Lord Community Health Center is a community health center that provides services for LGBT people. We know that people come from all over in order to receive sensitive medical care at our center, and it's very hard to find it elsewhere. So hopefully, where you all are working, you're going to help to create a sensitive place for this community. So breaking down the terms. I'm going to talk about the different terms that are involved in uh, transgender and LGBT identities. So I'm going to bring it back a little bit to talk about gender because it's really important to understand that in moving forward to understand different identities around sexual orientation and gender identity. So often we'll think about gender in three different ways. The sex or gender that you were born as, uh, gender expression and how you express your, your gender so that can be basically what kind of clothes you wear, your behavior, anything around how you express your gender. And gender identity, and that's a key piece in understanding transgender people. So I'm going to focus on gender identity. 
Gender identity is your internal self-conception of your gender. The most important thing about that is that no one can tell anyone else what their gender identity is. That is for you to decide for yourself, and that is a constantly changing thing. So it is impossible to predict with complete confidence what gender any child will eventually come to identify with. This is a quote from the Intersex Society of North America, and I think it's a great quote, especially if you're doing work with patients or clients across the lifespan. So it, any, at any point in life, someone can come out as a different sexual orientation or a different gender identity, and it's not something you can predict at any time. And that's why it's so important, as I'll talk about later, that you constantly ask the, the right health assessment questions, that the, you ask the correct questions that are sensitive so that someone can feel comfortable coming out to you. And all of us have a gender identity, as I said before, but for some of us, it matches the gender you were assigned as, as male or female, our bodies and social perceptions, and for others, it doesn't. And it is for the people that it doesn't match that that is uh, where we're going to understand more about transgender identity. So often because we put the, the terms together, LGBT, it gets confused sometimes. We can't separate the, out the differences between gender identity and sexual orientation. So different terms that you'll hear used are sexual orientation, sexual identity, sexual behavior. Basically, we're referring to the direction of your sexual attraction, basically who you're attracted to. So you'll hear terms like lesbian, a woman attracted to another woman, gay, a gay male, a man who's attracted to another man, bisexual, both genders. Um, queer is another term, sort of a broader term that people use to encompass a lot of different identities or more fluidity of identities. And heterosexual is a term that you'll know more. Uh, identity versus behavior. This is very important, especially when you're doing work with patients and clients, because someone may not identify as a lesbian, as a gay man, bisexual, but their behavior may indicate that to you. So let's say a man comes in and is having sex with other men, uh, but doesn't identify themselves as gay, or maybe is married to a woman. That's why it's really important that you do a, a good sexual health history, a sensitive sexual health history that gets at those issues that might be behind it. So knowing that although you might have someone that identifies a certain way, um, that doesn't necessarily tell you everything about their behavior. And maybe people don't feel comfortable talking about their behavior with you, so that's why it's very important to make that patient or that client feel comfortable with you and the kinds of questions that you ask. And being transgender doesn't mean you're gay, and being gay doesn't mean you're transgender. So often we'll get those confused as well. There's similarities in the sense of discrimination about gender expression, right? So if a gay male is more effeminate, they tend to experience some discrimination in society. And the discrimination that a transgender person faces, it's similar kinds of discrimination, but different identities. So it's discrimination on the basis of gender expression. So that gives you a little bit more to understand the differences in the terms gender identity versus sexual orientation. So transgender. Um, you're going to certainly hear a lot of different definitions when it comes to transgender. So I, I try to use as broad a, a definition as possible. So people who feel the binary gender, meaning two genders, male or female, that they were assigned at birth. And the reason I use assigned at birth is because a community of in, people who they call themselves intersex, or other terms that they might use are DSD, which refers to people who were born with, with, quote, ambiguous genitalia, and a doctor decides if they should have a penis or a vagina. And the reason I bring that up is because even the gender we were born as is not as fixed as we might think. So I use the term gender assigned at birth to include that community. So people who feel the binary gender that they were assigned at birth is a misleading or incomplete description of themselves. Very broad, but really understanding that the people who feel that their gender is different than the gender that they were assigned to birth. And some other terms that you might hear, certainly in a medical setting, you might hear this a little bit more, is transgender woman or transgender man. So ways to understand that is you're going to use the term trans woman to refer to a person who was assigned male at birth, right, when they were born. They were assigned as a male, as a boy, and they live or identify their life as a woman some point in their life, whether it be when they were younger, when they were older, they feel like a woman on the inside. And the flip uh, expression, transgender man, refers to a person who was assigned female at birth and lives or identifies their life as a man. The best way to remember this, sometimes people get confused with these terms, is you want to call someone how they identify their life now. That's the most empowering way to refer to someone, right? So if someone calls themselves a woman now, that's what you're going to call, that's how you're going to address them. 
if they want to be used, they want to use she pronouns, that's the pronoun you're going to use. If they call themselves a transgender man and they want to use he pronouns, they want to be referred to as a man, those are the terms that you're going to use. So again, using the terms of someone, how they identify their life now and not necessarily the way that they were born. And you might need that information, especially as a medical provider, as a nurse, you might need to know the information about the gender they were born as to help give the best services you can give. But be aware that it's important to explain why you need that information. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. Some additional terms that you might hear, um, this is a term that people might not be as familiar with. The term is called cisgender. And it refers to people whose gender identity and gender expression align with the sex they were assigned at birth. Basically, the old term, or the term that people might still use, is non-transgender, anyone who does not identify as transgender. The reason that people are using this term now is because it takes the focus away from transgender people. Instead of saying there are transgender people and then there's everyone else, um, we like to use the term cisgender to refer to people who are not transgender. And so that might be a term that you hear. Another term you might hear is gender non-conforming which refers to people who do not follow other people's ideas or stereotypes about how they should look or act based on the female or male sex they were assigned at birth. It's a broader term. Sometimes people will use that instead of transgender to be sort of more broad and more fluid with their, with their gender. And a great organization that um, uses this term is the Silver Rivera Law Project, which is an organization that provides legal resources to low-income transgender people and transgender people of color. So it's a great resource to have. And pronouns, so when I use the term pronouns, we know the pronouns she and he and her but and him, but you may not know the term the and here. Those are gender neutral pronouns that people might use, but your patients or clients may say, will you use gender neutral pronouns with me? It's important to ask your patient what pronouns they would like you to use. And so you can use the and here in ways to not be gendered in the pronouns you're using. Other things you can use is to say the term they, you can use the patient's name, can always ask them what pronoun they want to use. And I would say it's very important to not use a pronoun with someone unless you've asked them what they would like you to use. Some other terms that you might hear, especially in a medical setting, we'll talk about transition, right? So we'll talk about different ways of transitioning. And gender transition can happen in many different ways. It's basically the process of changing your gender expression or your physical appearance to basically align more closely with how you feel on the inside, your gender identity. This can involve a lot of different things, so there's not just one way to transition. You can change your name, legally or not legally. Uh, you can change your de gender designation on your legal documents, meaning your, your license, your passport, whatever it might be, your health insurance card, ch changing your gender marker on that, or medical intervention, things like hormones or surgery. Those are all the different ways that one can transition, and it's gonna happen on many different levels for people. So it's important not to assume that there's only one way of transitioning, and there are many, many different ways. So you need to check in with your patient to see what transition means to them. Another term that you might hear is gender affirmation, which is similar to transition, but it's basically saying that you're affirming the gender that you feel on the inside. So some people use that as a more positive way to talk about transition, to saying you're affirming the gender that you feel. So understanding the barriers. This is really key to providing a welcoming environment. And you'll see I use this uh, image, homophobia in healthcare is unhealthy. And it's a great image in thinking about uh, why we need to focus on LGBT issues and why we need to understand homophobia and transphobia within healthcare. So there's uh, a great chart that is from Lambda Legals, When Healthcare Isn't Caring, which is a really wonderful resource, especially when it comes to looking at survey and statistics around care. So when you're doing work, if you want to think about where are LGBT people accessing health care, and so where you work might be helpful to think about. So you'll see that TGNC actually stands for transgender and gender nonconforming, and then the green one is LGB. And you can see that the majority of people are accessing care through a private doctor, but you'll see there's a, um, there's a difference between LGB people are accessing care more at their private doctors than transgender and gender nonconforming people. Transgender and gender nonconforming people might be accessing care more at a public clinic, at an LGBT-specific clinic, or in the emergency room, or you'll see it 5.1% uh, nowhere. So it's important to know where you're going to see LGBT people, where they feel comfortable, where they're accessing care. And when we're talking about health disparities, there are wonderful resources that are out there that you can share with your colleagues, that you can share with your patients or clients, with anyone that you're working with or if you're doing trainings yourself. So the Institute of Medicine report 
that just came out, uh, The Health of Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, and Transgender People. Healthy People 2010 has a companion document for LGBT health, which is a great companion document to look at. It has a lot of information in it. And then Healthy People 2020 focuses on LGBT health as well. So you have these resources available to you to be able to provide some more information ongoing. So some more surveys, some more information from Lambda Legal. This is about the fears and concerns about accessing healthcare. And this is a really great resource to look at. And it compares lesbian, gay, and bisexual people, transgender people, and people living with HIV and AIDS. And you'll notice just by looking at it that is the transgender population has the highest rate of fears and concerns in each of the, the different categories. So being scared about being refused medical services because they are transgender. You'll see also because uh, living, people living with HIV also have these fears as well. Uh, medical personnel will treat me differently because I am transgender, LGB, or living with HIV. And about the highest one here is not enough health professionals adequately trained to care about people who are transgender, people living with HIV, or lesbian, gay, and bisexual people. And that's why we're all on this webinar today is to really understand how to be better trained, how to be better educated about these issues. And know that your patients and clients have this feeling inside. They know that you're not educated about it. They, they can feel that you don't have as much information about it, and that's going to impact their care, right? So a little bit more about the barriers to health care for LGBT people. So we know that often LGBT community may have lower income or lower health insurance rates, and that's going to impact their ability to access care. Previous negative experiences in healthcare settings. This is one of the biggest ones. When you walk into a healthcare setting and you already are discriminated against, uh, whether it be from the front desk to the per medical provider, you're not going to want to come back in for care. And so that's going to certainly be a barrier. Lack of provider information and knowledge about LGBT health needs and risk. So even very well-intentioned medical providers, nurses, social workers, they just not have enough information and knowledge about it. And that's going to make LGBT people feel like they don't want to be there for care because you don't have information that they need. Uh, lack of LGBT-specific research policies and procedures. So I've talked a little bit about the research and policies that are out there, but there's not enough, and that does cause some barriers in the community. And multiple stigmas, so race, class, ability, geographic location, immigrant status. If you think about how it's going to be very different for, let's say, a, a white uh, cisgender, non-transgender gay man to access health care than it might be for a transgender person of color. So those things are going to be very different. So being able to target you, the way that you do your uh, outreach, your education, your services for each population and different and understanding the stigmas that each population might face. So this is a great resource uh, put out by the Movement Advancement Project about LGBT families. Talks a little bit more about these barriers I was talking about before, but focuses on LGBT families. So LGBT adults are less likely to have health insurance than their heterosexual counterparts. So this is um, certainly going to be an impact care that's provided. And often LGBT people can't find places that they can go to where they, they can access care on sliding scale or without insurance. Uh, for transgender people, the language within the plan, so let's say they do have health insurance, may exclude coverage for both routine care and transition-related care. So we know that for transgender people, the care that they might need around their transition or just regular routine care might be excluded because of the language that's in the plan. Uh, so for example, if a health insurance company knows that a transgender person is on hormones such as estrogen or testosterone, they may say that an unrelated medical issue is related to that and, don't, and they won't cover it. Or if you take, for example, a transgender man, let's say, that's again someone who was born female and lives their life now as a man, Maybe they change their health insurance to be male on their health insurance card, on their license, on other forms, and they come in for a gynecologist appointment, they come in for a PAP, let's say. That health insurance company isn't going to cover their services, right, because they're going to see that uh, someone that's male on their health insurance is going to get a PAP, and that doesn't make sense to the health insurance coverage, uh, health insurance company, so it's not going to get covered. On the flip side, let's say a transgender woman comes in for prostate screening, a similar thing is going to happen. So why I say this is just so you understand those barriers and also as a, a provider that you can help advocate for that community and you know call the health insurance company and let them know that this is a medically necessary procedure. Uh, reduced access is especially pronounced among LGBT people of color. So this document really talks about how LGBT people of color have even less access than white LGBT people. So it's important to reach out and to understand these communities. 
and narrow definition of family. So thinking about health insurance, child care assistance, you know, health care proxy, all of those things may not be available to LGBT families because they have a very narrow definition of families, meaning just heterosexual families. So look at the documents you might have in your hospital and your health center and make sure that they're inclusive of this community. So some of the health issues, certainly we could talk for a very long time on what are the specific LGBT health issues. So it's not only just about, you know, making sure that your, your uh, health center, your hospital, your school is welcoming, but also do you understand what the specific health issues are going to be for this community? So some of them, uh, smoking, alcohol, and substance use we know is higher in the LGBT community. So certainly if you are working in any of the fields where you're focusing on smoking, alcohol, and substance use, know that you are going to see probably a disproportionate amount of the LGBT people. Uh, mental health il illnesses such as anxiety and depression. It's important to note here that it's not because someone is uh, LGBT that they therefore have anxiety and depression, but it's because the society around us is very homophobic and transphobic, meaning discriminating against lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender people. And that can cause, understandably, a lot of anxiety and depression. Sexual and reproductive health. So a lot of sexual and reproductive health is focused on heterosexual people, whether it be the brochures about it, information, the research. It's really important to get information that's specific to this population. Uh, we find that eating disorders and obesity is also high in this population. And cardiovascular health, there may be some issues about this, especially related to stress. A lot of stress in this population related to the discrimination I was talking about earlier. Um, there can be higher rates of sexually transmitted diseases. Increased cancer risk. So the work that I do at Maimonides Medical Center is uh, specifically with cancer patients. And we find that certainly in that work and the work that I do at Cal Lord, that a lot of LGBT populations are scared to come in for care, not getting routine screenings. So we know if, if any group of people is not getting routine screenings, they're going to have a higher risk for cancer. So a lot of work being done around this as well, especially in the LGBT cancer network. There's limited evidence-based research on hormones. So transgender people that are interested in hormones may not have a lot of research out there about the work that's being do done on hormones and understanding long-term effects. And then intimate partner violence. So the term that you probably have heard more often is domestic violence. Uh, often in the LGBT community, we will use the term intimate partner violence. And that sort of can be more inclusive of the LGBT community. And you'll see on the right there's an image uh, for Southern Comfort, which is a great documentary that you should all watch if you haven't, which is about Robert Eads, who was a transgender man um, who was, whose care for cancer was uh, refused, uh, nine different doctors refused to care for him. He ended up having uh, dying from ovarian cancer because doctors refused to see him. So what it's like for someone who lives their life as a man who looks like Robert Eads to come into a women's health or a GYN center and being refused care. Unfortunately, this is something that still happens today and why it's so important that we create these welcoming environments. So just to focus uh, specifically on LGBT intimate partner violence, if you're doing work around domestic partner violence at all, it's important to understand intimate partner violence. So Something that's specific to LGBT populations is threatening to out the partner, right? So if there is um, if someone is not talking to other people um, or open with other people about their sexual orientation or gender identity for many different reasons with their family, with their colleagues, um, the violence that could happen in the, in the partnership or in the relationship is one could threaten to out another person, which could be very difficult, may lead to loss of employment, housing, child custody, and other things like that. Minority stress, so just thinking about what it's like for an LGBT person to be out in a society that might experience stress and pressure of living in a society that does discriminate against LGBT people. And fewer sources of support. So if you think about shelters that are out there, support groups, crisis lines, a lot of them are geared towards heterosexual people who are not transgender or cisgender, often heterosexual cisgender women. So if you focus on transgender people, think about what it might be like for, let's say, a transgender woman who needs to go into a women's shelter. A lot of transgender women experience harassment, discrimination, or just not allowed access into these shelters, rape crisis shelters, housing shelters, domestic violence shelters. So it's important to make sure that, especially if you're working, let's say, in a hospital and you need to refer someone out, make sure that the place you're referring them out to is sensitive for LGBT people. And LGBT victimization is often underreported. So there could be a lot more victimization of LGBT people if people don't feel comfortable talking about that discrimination, whether it be because talking to the police, 
working within the courts is not a, the most sensitive place for this population. So now I'm going to focus on youth. So we're talking across the youth, uh, across the lifespan. And these three images are just different organizations and reports that are helpful when you're working with LGBT youth. So the Ali Fournay Center, uh, specific to New York, is the LGBT youth uh, center that's a really helpful place if you need to refer people out. And the Center Youth C Fierce, which is another group in New York that focuses on LGBT people of color, young people of color, and has great resources. And then Lambda Legal put out a national recommended best practices for serving LGBT homeless youth. So I'd just like to give out resources so you will have things moving forward to help educate. Some of the issues that are specifically for youth are LGBT youth are increased risk for suicide and depression. Smoking, alcohol, and substance use is much higher for LGBT youth. Uh, the homeless youth population comprises a disproportionate number of LGBT youth, often because people are kicked out of their homes for being LGBT. They may not get support from their families. So you'll see in the homeless youth population, there are a lot more LGBT youth. And LGBT youth report experiencing much higher levels of violence, victimization, and harassment. And the Gay and Lesbian Straight Education Network, LISTEN, did a national survey of LGBTQ students that found that 64.3% felt unsafe in their school because of their sexual orientation. And 84% had been verbally harassed at school because of their gender identity expression. And the reason we talk about this is if you're working with young people at all, it's important to know that LGBTQ young people are going to face this kind of discrimination, this kind of fear, this kind of violence. So on the other side of the lifespan, thinking about older adults, there's some great resources out there. Uh, you'll see Improving the Lives of Transgender Older Adults, um, this is a resource that's put out by SAGE in New York. Uh, in the center, the Le uh, LGBT Health Access Project, the Massachusetts Department of Public Health put out these really great resources. You'll see it says, deserves the same care no matter who these hands embrace. And homophobia in healthcare is unhealthy. What I like about this is it's an image of an older person and it talks about LGBT issues. Often older people and younger people don't see themselves represented in resources. And then the last one, inclusive services for LGBT older adults, how to create a welcoming agency. So all of these are great resources that you all can access. Some of the issues that are specifically for older adults is the kind of stigma and discrimination and violence they might face throughout their lives. So thinking about the accumulated trauma of experiencing stigma, discrimination, and violence throughout the lifespan. Isolation, not feeling connected to community support because maybe it's not focused on older adults. Lack of family support, a lot of people you know, not feeling like they can get support from their family. Social security and pension plans exclusion, so maybe not being inclusive of partnerships, not being inclusive of transgender identities or services. Long-term facilities, so for anyone that works in any kind of long-term facility, this is a place where a lot of LGBT older adults experience discrimination or harassment or just not people that understand them. Uh, visitation, so if they're having a partner visit them, making sure that all of your policies are inclusive of any kind of uh, visitation, of any kind of partner, of any kind of relationship that might exist. And hospice, certainly hospice, we want to be an empowering and uh, you know comforting experience for an LGBT older adult. but Maybe the hospice staff is not educated on LGBT issues. So that's a field that needs a lot of education as well. And just having connection to community. So if you have services for LGBT older adults, that can be really helpful for that community. And programs and resources. So look at the programs and resources you might have at the center you're working on and make sure that they're inclusive of older adults. So now I'm going to focus specifically on transgender health. I've talked a little bit about transgender communities before, but I want to focus on what are the specific health issues so that in your hospital, in your health center, in your school, you can understand what these health issues are. But another resource that I really love uh, is this image deserves the same care no matter which pronoun is used. And transphobia in healthcare is unhealthy. These are posters that you can order yourself from the Massachusetts Department of Public Health. Sometimes it's really helpful to just have images around where LGBT people are represented. And at the end of the presentation, I'll talk about those kinds of images that you can have up. So you'll see in this uh, survey that how to close the LGBT health disparity gap, the percent of adults delaying or avoiding medical care. You see 48% of transgender adults and 29% of the LGBT 
LGB adults are delaying or avoiding medical care compared to 17% of heterosexual adults. So you can see right here why it's so important to create a welcoming environment because you don't want any of your patients or, or clients to delay or avoid medical care. And we can make that connection. If you're delaying or avoiding medical care, it can lead to many different health issues. Focusing on transgender discrimination, the, the National Transgender Center for Equality uh, surveyed about over 6,000 transgender individuals and found these results. 41% of transgender people can't change their gender on their identification. So what does that mean? What, what does that mean to you all working in different places? You're going to get uh, patients and clients who are going to show identification to you that may not match the way they look. And that in itself is a very scary thing to do. State by state, it decides how you can change your gender marker. So some states say you need to see a therapist. Some states say you need to have surgery. Some states will even say what kind of surgery you need to have. And for a lot of transgender people, they may not be interested in surgery, or surgery is so expensive they can't afford it. So they may not be able to change the gender marker on their ID. 57% were rejected by families, 19% have experienced homelessness, 19% refused medical care, and 47% have attempted suicide. So this gives you a kind of a snapshot of the discrimination this community might face. So Transgender Law Center, another great resource when you're focusing on transgender health disparities, uh, showed that 42% delayed seeking health care because they couldn't afford it, and 26% reported health conditions worsened because they postponed care. These are connections we can sort of make, right? But it's sometimes it's important to have the numbers to back it. A little bit more on numbers is experiences of discrimination for specifically for transgender and gender nonconforming people compared to lesbian, gay, and bisexual. And you'll see throughout this, the blue marker is higher for transgender and gender nonconforming people. And the highest is feeling that providers are unaware of their health needs. We talked about this earlier, but just another sort of snapshot to show you, and that they feel treated differently because they are transgender or provided worse care. You can sort of go through and look, look at the kinds of uh, fears and discrimination that this community faces. So what is gender identity discrimination? It's basically just being denied equal access to health care because or, or facing insensitive environments because one is or perceived to be transgender or gender nonconforming. I say perceived to be because there are people who may not identify as transgender, but their gender is just different than other people assume a man should look like or a woman should look like, and they're also going to experience harassment in healthcare. Some of the barriers I touched on earlier to, for healthcare for transgender people are being denied healthcare. We'll see at, at Cal and Lord, patients will come to us who are transgender who have said they were denied healthcare elsewhere. Lack of informed care, research, and data. If you are doing any kind of research and data in a position to do research, it's really important to focus on this community. Healthcare coverage. So I alluded to this earlier, thinking about transgender people either not having coverage, uh, being fired from their jobs for transitioning and therefore not having health insurance, or having health insurance but not getting things covered, like routine medical care, anything gendered, as I talked about earlier, like uh, GYN visits, prostate screenings, anything like that might not be covered. Sex segregated services. So anything out there that is segregated in some way by gender or sex. You know, I talked about the women's health, uh, women's crisis center or rape crisis center that might not be inclusive for a transgender person. Uh, inappropriate name or pronoun use. So this may not seem like a big deal, but for transgender people, when they're being called the wrong name, a, a name that they don't go by anymore that might uh, out them as transgender, or being called a pronoun they don't that, that they don't identify with they're not going to come back to your health center or to your hospital. And it's really important to engage people in care. Invasive questions about genitalia or transgender status. So transgender people will get this on a daily basis. Questions that have absolutely nothing to do with why they're there. People are just curious about their genitalia or anything about their transgender issues because maybe they haven't ever experienced it before. This is why it's so important when you have a transgender person in your office, in your exam room, wherever it might be, that you explain why you need any of the information you need. So if someone's coming in for a sore throat, you're not going to ask them about their genitalia. If you need to ask them about that, you're going to explain why. Because it's so important that they understand why you're asking and it's not out of curiosity. Access to hormones and surgery. So transgender people often find barriers in finding places that will give them access to hormones and surgery. It will give them any information on it. And patient trans status often overshadows other significant medical needs. So this is what I was talking about earlier. So I've seen this before in the emergency room and other places where someone will come in, let's say, for a broken arm or something, and the focus is all about their genitalia, all about their transgender status. And we know that that obviously is not where the focus should be. So being really aware of 
someone's transgender that you're still focusing just like you would with any patient on why they're there and explaining why you need the information you need. Intake and registration forms I'm going to talk about towards the end, how to change um, or edit your forms to make sure they're inclusive for transgender people. And confidentiality and privacy, clearly important for any patient, right? But if you think about a transgender person, if you're, let's say, a transgender man is coming to your front desk and you say your next uh, GYN appointment is next week, so what you've done there is uh, you've outed them as someone who was born a woman, right? And if anyone else hears that, that could uh, cause violence or discrimination down the road. So just being very careful with your privacy and confidentiality issues for all communities, but definitely for transgender people. So this is a, a chart that focuses on the limited access to medical care for transgender people. Uh, transphobia, clearly that's going to cause limited access, the fear or hatred of transgender people. Limited clinical research, you know, you're going to have less access or less understanding around transgender issues if there's not a lot of research in that department. Health insurance coverage I talked about a lot earlier. Legal protection, um, just, you know, there might be legal protection for transgender people state by state, but people don't know about it, so often harassment exists. Discrimination in employment, housing, healthcare, bathrooms. So bathrooms is a really big issue for this community. For, for, many, for many people, it might be very easy to kind of walk into a bathroom, decide which one you're going to go to. You don't even think about it. You walk into a women's or a men's bathroom. For transgender people, this decision is a lot more difficult. You have to make that decision today. Where will I experience the least amount of harassment? So what does this mean for you working in a hospital, a health center? Look at your bathrooms and think about whether they're gender neutral or not. Think about how comfortable a transgender person would feel in them. Poverty, a lot of people experiencing poverty, lack of education, um, maybe transgender young person who dropped out of school because of the discrimination that they faced, social marginalization, uh, lack of curriculum. Certainly I focused on this a lot, but if you think about your own curriculum in nursing and medical school and social work school, wherever, whatever school you might have gone to, there's so little information about transgender health or transgender issues. Lack of targeted prevention efforts, so preventing, you know, let's talk about safer sex, if we talk about, let's say, uh, mental health resources, substance abuse, making sure that these are inclusive places for this community. Lack of positive mental health resources. So, uh, they, you know, still exists in the DSM and the Diagnostic Statistical Manual that says that there's a gender identity disorder. So similar as in the 70s it was taken out that homosexuality was a disorder. So it still exists that people talk about gender identity issues as a disorder. It's really important that if you're sending a patient to a mental health resource or if you yourself are a mental health resource that someone understands that this is not a disorder but this is something that people can feel comfortable and empowered to talk about. Uh, HIV risk behavior, if you do any work on HIV risk behavior, you know that there's a connection between lower self-esteem and higher HIV risk behavior. And in the transgender population, there tends to be lower self-esteem, mostly because of the messages that are sent around this community. And this can lead to things like unprotected sex, underground hormones, meaning if a transgender person doesn't feel comfortable coming to your center to start hormones, estrogen or testosterone, they might find other ways to do it, right? They might be doing it on the street, could be sharing needles, or silicone injections. Often transgender women may be uh, injecting silicone to be able to walk down the street and feel more comfortable with the way their outside looks, having more curves, feeling more like a woman so that they experience less harassment. So it's important to understand why people are injecting silicone and how to talk to them about it, how to talk about harm reduction and things like that. So these are some of the issues that transgender community might face. And certainly if you're doing work in school, you know that one of the barriers is curriculum in schools. And you'll see down there that I have a picture of a doctor. I know it's about scrubbing in, but I like to think of the image of putting up your hands and saying, I know nothing about this community because that is often what we face when we go out there and talking to doctors and nurses and other providers. Silence in Nursing School, this is a great resource uh, article, Nurses Silence on LGBT Issues, and the study looked at nursing literature through five years, uh, nursing literature, literature for publications related to LGBT health in the top 10 nursing journals. And the result is really important to talk about, so only 0.16% of articles focused on LGBT health, so that's eight of nearly 5,000 articles. So certainly we need some more information there because that's where a lot of people get their information about health issues. In medical school, uh, there's a great resource, the LGBT Medical Education Research Group at Stanford also did a study and they found that the medium time related to LGBT content in all of the curriculum within medical school was five hours. We certainly know five hours is not nearly enough to talk about these issues. 
And most importantly to take from this is the silence in nursing medical literature can render LGBT people, families, and communities invisible and perpetuate health disparities. So if you're focusing on health disparities at all, know that if we don't have that information out there in the medical literature and nursing literature, social work and other fields, there's going to be more health disparities in this community because there's less information about the health issues. So finally, we're going to talk about integrating strategies. I know that was a lot around barriers, but I do think it's really important to understand those barriers so you can better integrate strategies into the place that you work. And I want you all to think about, as we're going through integrating strategies, your specific workplace or school, wherever you might be, um, talking about how will this work for the place in which you're at. So the most important thing is that when you go back to work or wherever you might be is to look around. Look around the health center, the hospital, look at the walls, and think about is this a welcoming place for the LGBT community? Scan the environment, right? So looking at everything around you. Think about what it's like for your patient before they enter the door. That's a very important thing. A patient's going to feel way more comfortable with you if you can understand that they may have experienced harassment on the street before they even came into your door. So they might already be you know, distrustful, be angry, experience any kind of trauma around LGBT issues. Make sure that you have relevant and appropriate health information and brochures. So if you have a waiting room and you have information in the waiting room, look at those that information. You'll notice that a lot of information at health centers and hospitals tend to be focused on heterosexual people, maybe white heterosexual people. And that's not going to speak to the LGBT community, to people of color, to people of different identities. So make sure that your brochures are more inclusive and there are brochures and posters that you can get that can help your center be more inclusive. And that, therefore, a patient's going to sit in that waiting room and think, all right, I might feel a little bit more comfortable here because they put a brochure out that represents me. Some of the issues you might want to think about are related to cancer, safe, safer sex, HIV and AIDS, uh, screenings, all of that, those information is really important, right? But making sure that your brochures around them also uh, speak to the LGBT population and not just heterosexual people. So sometimes it's just about images or about words that are relevant to this community. Signs and posters, so thinking about what you can put up. Sometimes it's as easy as putting up a rainbow sticker, which communicates to LGBT people that this might be an inclusive place, a welcoming and understanding place for them. And advertise your practice. So one great way of advertising is to um, go into the Glamour site and advertise your practice as an LGBT positive and empowering place to be. Because people will go on to the Glamour site or to other sites and think about where can I go that's going to be sensitive. Often it's word of mouth. When someone has a positive experience somewhere, they'll tell someone else that it was a good experience. So a great resource, especially if you're working in hospitals, uh, is the Joint Commission. All of us who work in hospitals know that we're usually scared of the Joint Commission when they come, but thinking about this great resource that focuses on LGBT people. So advancing effective communication, cultural competency, and patient and family-centered care for the LGBT community. This is a guide for all people, certainly working in hospitals and other places as well, of how we can focus more on this uh, community. And it's also a great resource that you can give to administration in a hospital or health center that shows that the Joint Commission is focusing on this and therefore this uh, center should as, as well. So one thing that's important and the Joint Commission talks about in other places as well is policies. So take a look at your policies, especially if you're working in administration in any way. Look at the, look at the policies and make sure that they're inclusive to LGBT people and make sure they're posted. So sometimes an LGBT person will come in and want to see that there's a non-discrimination policy that you have and it's posted and it includes sexual orientation and gender identity. And that's something that you can easily post on the wall so that someone feels more comfortable. Again, I put sexual orientation and gender identity because some places only have sexual orientation and that doesn't necessarily cover transgender people. So intake and assessment. Thinking about when someone walks into the door and has to fill out an intake and assessment or registration form. All reception, intake, and assessment staff should be trained to use culturally appropriate language and assure appropriate referrals. So referrals is a really big deal. It's certainly very difficult for a lot of people to know where to refer people. Certainly when we have to send people from Cal and Lord, we want to make sure we're not re-traumatizing them and sending them to a place that might not be sensitive. So make sure that your referral resources are sensitive. Call the places and say, I'm going to send a, you know, a lesbian a woman over, a transgender person over. Do you have sensitive resources? Is are you trained on this before you send someone in? And develop 
appropriate intake and assessment forms that address gender identity, sexual orientation, partnership, um, provide clients with options. I think, you know, maybe a blank line to be able to fill in more information. So this is a, what, one example of a registration form that we use at Cal Lord that I thought would be helpful to focus on for you all to think about your own registration forms. First thing right off the bat, we ask the legal name, uh, legal last name, legal first name. Now, this is important to explain. I'm going to explain a little bit why we ask that information. But it's important for people to know that they can also put a chosen name if it's different. So a transgender person maybe hasn't legally changed their name or is not interested in legally changing their name. They know that you have provided an option for them to put a chosen name so they will be called by that chosen name, not their legal name. We don't have marital status question, but if you do, you might want to change that to partner. That's a way to be inclusive. Um, and this is a really important field. I know it is a lot of information, but it explains why we require the information. Because certainly for transgender people, they're going to think, why do you need to know my legal name, my legal gender? I don't want to give you that information. But if you say, you know, this is important for registration, for insurance, for grant reporting, anything like that, so people feel more comfortable and they know that they have another option just in case. And then around sex and gender. So we ask the sex assigned at birth, but we also ask your gender identity, how you identify with all of these choices, your sexual orientation, with many choices. So the people know that they might be putting that information that's scary to put down, but they're also putting how they identify now. And that gives a well-rounded information to the provider when they see them. And again, we have to ask the sex listed in the insurance policy, but people will understand then why you're asking that information if you have that other option of saying how you identify it now. So service planning and delivery. So how do you actually do the delivery of services? Developing and implementing training. So this is one of the most important things, to have ongoing training for your staff. And every place should have some kind of orientation, right? When you're a new staff, you're starting at a hospital, health center, you always have some kind of orientation. If you can put within that orientation information about LGBT health, even if it's just a, you know, a little bit of information, some resources, so that new staff trained will know that this is something you prioritize and will get some information, especially if they haven't gotten anything within school. And this is for all staff, not just for the front desk, not just for the medical providers, for intake assessment, supervisors, human resources, case management, anyone who is working at your organization, your health and your hospital, it's important to train them on these issues. For direct care staff, so for people that are doing directly, directly caring for patients and clients, making sure that they can identify and address basic health issues that affect the LGBT clients. So not just being able to use the right name or the right pronoun, but also saying this is the health issues that are going to face the population that you're working with. And make sure that you have a comprehensive resource list, which I talked about before, for referrals. So if you don't know if your referrals are sensitive, make those calls so that you are not sending someone into a, a position that could be really um, traumatizing or they may experience discrimination. And outreach to and development of relationships with other agencies. So let's say your center doesn't work that much with LGBT people. Look around in your community at the places that do, at the places that you know do have resources, and try to think about how to work with them in different ways or to use their resources or to network with them so that you can help you know, help understand how they do their services and do your services better. So training. This, a lot of the training that I do is in all schools, uh, for doctors, for nurses, for anyone working with or maybe working with LGBT populations. So specific to schools, um, some of the things that might be helpful is bringing in speakers for different classes, for the whole, uh, for the whole, um, of the whole of the students, whether it be in a certain class or within the whole school, um, speakers on LGBT issues or LGBT health. Sustainable curriculum change. So I say sustainable because often what I find is there will be, you know, one or two students in a school, in a med school or a nursing school that are really interested in talking about LGBT health. And once they leave the school, it's not something that's talked about anymore. So bringing in these resources in a sustainable way, so talking to the professors, to the faculty about making sure it's a part of the case studies, let's say, or part of the curriculum in a way that's going to continue. And making sure the policies are inclusive. For hospitals and health centers, uh, department needs assessment. So think about every single department in the hospital. Sometimes I focus on, let's say, security. You think, why does security need to be trained on this? But for some places, that you know, that's the first interaction they're going to have with someone at your hospital is the security. And there might be some issues around gender there, let's say, or some issues around harassment or discrimination. So the front desk, social workers, administrators, nurses, providers, everywhere, think about what do you need specifically on LGBT health. 
and make it specific to each floor, right? So a social worker might have a very different issue, let's say, than a front desk staff around how to be sensitive. And going beyond 101, which means going beyond the, you know, we need to be sensitive to this population and really getting in there and saying, what are the health issues? What are the issues we need to face at the place we are at right now? How do we make this place more welcoming? Um, and where can we go beyond the sort of introductory materials? Community connection and feedback. So make sure you're collecting uh, information on the population. Uh, make sure that you're connected to the community. So something we do at Cal Lord and other places is we, we can have community advisory boards. So we have a transgender community advisory board, a HIV community advisory board, a women's community advisory board that helps us understand what does the community need. So collecting that feedback, patient satisfaction survey, reaching out to our patients and saying what are we doing well, what are we not doing well, that are specific to the LGBT population. Focus groups. Um, at a hospital, you can have a point of contact for community members for complaints, feedback, comments. So let's say a um, patient advocate. At most hospitals, you'll find a patient advocate. Make sure they're trained on LGBT health issues or LGBT issues in general so that they can be a, a point person. Uh, ensure that the community outreach events are LGBT inclusive and again establishing these partnerships with other places. So asking questions. Um, people often ask what are offensive questions and what are not offensive questions. And I've talked about this earlier, but thinking about what is appropriate versus what you're curious about. And this often has to do with transgender populations, but not only. Um, if, you're, if you are talking with a transgender person and you're noticing that the questions you have are really just around curiosity and not around their healthcare needs, Keep that to yourself and you know, find these other resources that you can educate yourself about and explain why you need the information you need. So being really respectful in the questions, using sensitive language. Some examples, uh, out of respect for my patient's right to self-identify, I ask everyone what pronoun they use. What pronoun would you like me to use for you? Or don't use your pronoun until you know. This is a long way of saying it, but just asking someone what pronoun they want to be used is a way of saying to someone, I feel I want to communicate to you that I want this place to be sensitive for you, that I want to call you what you want to be called. Um, how do you identify your gender? That's a very broad way of asking the question and someone can feel like they can identify in any way. And looking at your intake forms to make sure that they're more inclusive. Most importantly, mirror the language people use for themselves, their partners, and their bodies. So, Asking people what language they use or listening to them and when they use language about their body and using that language is incredibly important. So you might learn all the terms you want to learn, but your patient might use a completely different term than what you know about. So you know, ask them about the term and use that term if that makes them feel more comfortable. In health assessment, you know, asking the questions and explaining why. So one example, to help assess your health risks related to, let's say, as fill in the blank, let's say you say cancer, uh, can you tell me about any history you've had with hormone use? This explains why you're asking the information you're asking. It also helps the patient understand the connection between, let's say, hormones, cardiovascular health, or hormones and cancer care. Use the patient's language regarding body parts and sexual history. And the reason I say this is, if you have a transgender person who has not had surgery, is not interested in surgery, and there are gender parts of their body that they don't identify with anymore, they're going to have a really hard time talking to you about their sexual health if you use terms like vagina or penis that they may not identify with. So if you say, I'm going to need to talk about your sexual history or I'm going to need to talk about parts of your body, is there, uh, are there words that you use that feel more comfortable for you? And then use those words throughout the session. That helps in developing trust and creating a safe place. And with, within the LGBT sensitive sexual history, using open-ended questions is really important. Avoiding assumptions. So if someone walks into your office, a man walks in to avoid questions like, do you have a girlfriend or a wife? Because certainly that's not being inclusive around LGBT issues. And have appropriate safe sex resources. When you give that person safe sex resources, don't give them a resource that's focused on heterosexual people, because that won't really speak to them. Specific to medical and nursing care, be sensitive clearly with your physical exams. I talked about OBGYN issues, but for transgender men, this is a big issue. They're not going to come in for OBGYN issues if they don't feel like the place is comfortable, if the place is sensitive and has seen transgender men before. Surgery, so being aware of post-surgery issues for transgender people. Certainly I haven't talked all about surgery resources or surgery issues that might come up in later webinars. but. If you are training yourself on post-surgical care, know what kinds of surgery transgender people have and what uh, post-surgery care might look like. Knowing risk factors, so knowing what the risk factors are for someone that was born a certain gender 
and may live their life as a different gender and may be on estrogen or testosterone. And one of my favorite quotes is, if you have it, check it, which basically means whatever you have on your body, you need to get checked out. Because if you think about it, if you put out a resource for women's health, a transgender man might not pick it up. It might be really uncomfortable for them to pick it up, but everything in it is what they need, right? But if you said, if you have this part of your body, get it checked out, right? The best way to think about this is if you think about a cisgender or a non-transgender woman who's uh, maybe uh, surviving breast cancer and had a mastectomy, they no longer have breasts, right? It doesn't make them any less of a woman, but they may not pick up a resource that's about breasts if it's for women's health. They may pick up something else. So just thinking about how everyone has different bodies. So it's important to focus on the body part that needs to get checked out and not gender it. So, you know, testicular and prostate exams, PAPs, uh, breast exams, HIV, STI screenings, these are all related to gendered parts of the body. It's important to just focus on not making it gendered and talking about the health care around it. So you'll see on the side, PAPs matter for transgender men, another great resource from uh, the Shelburne Health Center that talks about why it's important to get PAPs as a transgender man and puts more visuals out there so people feel comfortable. And another favorite quote I have is, if trans people can safely change their bodies to become who they truly are, they will protect those bodies because people who are happier in their bodies tend to take better care of them. It's a really simple quote, but I really like it and I think it's helpful when you're doing care with transgender populations. So we're coming to an end. I know I'm talking very fast. I just want to fit everything in. Scanning the environment, here are some ideas around how to put up information or how to change your bathroom. So I talked about gender neutral bathrooms before. Um, if you can have a bathroom that doesn't have a gender marker on it, or you'll see like self-identified men, gender neutral restroom, especially if you have a single stall bathroom anywhere in your hospital or your health center, and you label that a gender neutral bathroom, or you just don't have any gender marker on it, that's going to make a transgender person feel a lot more comfortable, that they don't need to walk into a gendered bathroom that could be incredibly uncomfortable. So make sure you identify that bathroom, or if you don't have it, tell the person you're working with, I know we don't have gender neutral bathrooms. Um, I can help, you know, walk you through the bathroom. We can make sure that you don't experience harassment, anything like that, so people feel more comfortable. And then how do you create a welcoming environment around, like things you can put up on the walls, things you can put in your exam room, um, include LGBT information brochures, as I talked about before, change your language, so talk about intimate partner violence, use the term partner, ask people about pronouns, Acknowledge days such as World AIDS Day, LGBT Pride Day, National Transgender Day of Remembrance, all of these different things that you can acknowledge within your health center or your hospital, and things that you can put up around from the National Coalition for LGBT Health, um, the Healthcare Equality Index that the Human Rights Campaign puts out, all of these things can be really helpful. Basically openly displaying signs of LGBT acceptance, maybe putting a little rainbow sticker on your uh, hospital name tag or something like that. So some other LGBT materials that you can access and can put out, um, the Vancouver Coastal Health Transgender Program, and you'll see the website there, is a really wonderful resource. They put out information on transgender people and cardiovascular disease, on cancer care, on osteoporosis, basically any kind of health information you can imagine related to transgender people, and you can print this out for your patients. The Center of Excellence for Transgender Health puts out a lot of information on all sorts of health issues, but a focus on HIV prevention among transgender people. This is resources we have at CalNord. It just shows, I mean, it's just an issue around, just a resource around vaccination, but you'll see a positive image for gay men there. Um, the American Cancer Society puts out cancer facts for lesbian and bisexual women. And of course, we've got GLAMA, um, you know, for patients and for providers, tons of resources out there. And lastly, evaluation, just make sure that you're evaluating the work that you do. So thinking about needs assessments, what do you need, what does your department need, what do your patients need, how can you have community focus groups, community advisory boards, just many, many ways for patients, for clients to give you suggestions and feedback and to continually evaluate the place in which you work. So moving forward, this is, for, this is homework for you all. I won't be checking on it, but homework for you all to think about what are the strategies that you have or that you've identified in moving forward around LGBT health and sensitivity? What are some of the challenges? That's sometimes the most important thing to focus on is to figure out what the challenges are and integrate this into your work. And what are the things that you need? What are the questions that you have? What are the resources that you need? So think about these questions. What can you do to advocate and raise awareness for LGBT care in your work? Where can it be integrated into your curriculum, your hospital, your health center, your organization? And most importantly, how can it be sustainable? How can it last for a long time? 
So that was a lot of talking on my part. I hope that that was uh, as much information as you could get, but certainly we're going to open up for questions if you have some more um, questions you might have or more resources that you might need. Great. Thank you very much, Nathan. So, um, Nathan, we do have a number of questions that are coming in, and I invite um, our attendees, if you do have a question, please go ahead and type it in the question box. Um, we have tried in the past to unmute um, the attendees, but that hasn't worked very successfully. So if you do have a question, please go ahead and type it in the question or chat box, and I will try to take as many of those as possible. Um, so Nathan, I'll start off with a few of the questions that I received during the webinar while you were presenting. And the first question says, um, what does DSD stand for related to intersex? Okay, so that's actually a term that's being used uh, more now instead of intersex, although you'll find that many people are, different, are using different terms. So it's been used in the past as, as disorders of sexual development. Um, people aren't using the term disorder as much now. Um, people might use like diagnosis of sexual development, different things around sexual development, because as I referred to it, it was around intersex communities or people that were born with, quote, ambiguous genitalia. And when I say ambiguous genitalia, this is decided by a medical provider, right? So it's saying either the penis is uh, too large, the clitor I'm sorry, the clitoris is too large, or the penis is too small, decided by a medical provider that that is not what a boy or a girl should look like. It's not necessarily a health issue, but it's often um, an appearance issue. And so that's another term that's being used in the community. And a lot of people in this community might say later on in life, I, I didn't consent to the surgery that was performed on my body, surgery to make me look more like, quote, a girl or more like, quote, a, a boy. Um, so that is another term that's being used in the community, a, an older term that's outdated and is often seen as a more offensive term, so I wouldn't use this as the term hermaphrodite, but that is a term that people often know a little bit more. Um, the, a great resource around this is the Intersex Society of North America, so that's a, a resource that you can certainly go to and get some more information. Great, thank you. The next question we have is, is gender nonconforming the same as folks who identify as gender queer? Oh, that's a great question. So um, they are two different terms, but they often are very similar. Because gender queer is often used as a way to be uh, more fluid in your gender. Maybe someone that identifies as uh, more than one gender or different genders at different times. Um, basically a way of saying it's not just about men male or female, that it's more, a little bit more fluid than that. And it's similar to the way queer is used around sexual orientation, um, a broader term, a more fluid term. Gender nonconforming is often used in the same way. Uh, it just basically, you know, it, people are going to identify in different ways. You're going to ask someone how they identify. So gender queer and gender nonconforming can be used interchangeably, but certainly you're going to talk to your patient or your client and ask which term works best for them. Um, in the way that it's being used, gender nonconforming, you can see from the word it's often used that someone doesn't conform to what a, you know, male or female, which is similar to gender queer, but it's just, you know, a little bit of different language. Great. Thank you, Nathan. Uh, the next question we have has to do with the data and the images that are in your PowerPoint presentation. And the person is wondering, are the data and images available in the public domain, and can they be used in other presentations? Sure. I mean, I would say almost everything that I've used, I've I've talked to the organization that's come from to make sure that it's that I can use it, and everything is available. So things like the Vancouver Coastal Health Resources, um, American Cancer Society. I'm just trying to think of the other anything that I put out there. I put a website underneath it where you can get some more information. So as long as you uh, resource the information and put where it's from, you can download information from there. A lot of these places are really great about putting them on their website, so you can download it. As, as long as you attribute the organization, the website, to the um, resource, then absolutely. Great. Thank you, Nathan. Um, we've had several people ask about receiving copies of the slides from the very first webinar in the webinar series. I just sent out to everyone. I hope you will have seen it. Um, and when you um, receive an email after this webinar, they are available on all three of our websites. So those are available for download as well as the recording. So I just wanted to put that out there. Uh, we have another question, and it is, is there any research or resources about the socioeconomic determinants of LGBT health? 
Yes, um, that, that's a great question because we find yeah, I showed some of the statistics that often LGBT people of are of a lower socio, low, lower socioeconomic class, or they may be experiencing poverty, or they may have lost health insurance. Um, there is some information out there, and I would say the, the best resource is one of the things that I put up from Lambda Legal. Lambda Legal is a great resource that they have a lot of information and reports focusing on LGBT populations, not just around healthcare, but also around other issues like race and class. And so I would definitely go to, I think it's the When Healthcare Isn't Caring, it's one of the reports that has information around class. And there's the other resource that I had in the presentation on LGBT families focuses on race and class. And I would look specifically at that because that's a great report that gives you a, more of a holistic view, a, a wider view around the different um, issues around race, class, gender, sexual orientation, and how they work together. Great. Thanks, Nathan. Um, what, another question that came in was, um, are there funds available to help indigent clients pay for sex reassignment surgery? That is a great question. I wish, I mean, as far as I know, there there aren't. I know I heard once about scholarships that different organizations um, that work with transgender people might put out. Uh, there's certainly not a lot of funds, but there is a little bit. So when you find organizations that work with transgender people, like Silver Bear Law Project in New York, and other resources, other organizations that work with transgender people, they might have some some access to scholarships around um, money for surgery. But I don't know of a lot offhand. I know that that is a really big barrier for the community because often surgeries are thousands and thousands of dollars, and you can imagine difficult for anyone to afford, but definitely for transgender people that may or may not have jobs or you know may not have access to that kind of resource. So I would connect with any organization that's working with transgender people and ask them if they have scholarships, if they have resources like that. Um, but off the top of my head, I don't really know of any. Great. Thanks, Nathan. We actually had someone um, who just um, submitted a resource, um, and I apologize if I mispronounced this in advance. Dana Bevan, or Bevan says, I think the Gill Foundation provides some scholarships for sex reassignment surgery. So that might be something oh, to look great. into. Yeah, that just came in while we're sitting here. Okay. Um, another question. We have lots of great co questions coming in. So in your presentation, you had those great gender-neutral restroom signs with the explanation. The uh, questioner is wondering where can you actually get a hold of those? So actually, I um, I mean, I've asked for it from some organizations, but I did just Google at one point gender neutral bathrooms, and I found a ton of images. Um, I've taught, I know organizations that use it, that use gender neutral bathrooms, different universities. Uh, I don't, I think it's within the, the image, I forget which one, but there are a few different universities now that have gender neutral bathroom signs that they put up. There are resources, a lot of them, a lot of the universities were in California, but I really did just research and, you know, just put in Google images, gender neutral bathrooms, and that's actually how I found a lot of those resources, and then I call the organization or the university um, and ask them a little bit more. So it was very interesting research for me because I found out a little bit more about the process that went into it. There's this really great video called Toilet Training that the Rivera Law Project puts out, and it helps you in your organization, your school, um, to basically create gender neutral bathrooms, talks about why it's important, sort of helpful in showing to administrators or staff about why this is an important thing to do and how to do it within what you might have, right? A single stall bathroom, um, maybe not, you know, maybe multiple stalls. So there are a lot of different places and mostly a lot of universities that are establishing gender neutral bathrooms. In high schools and elementary schools, I found a little bit as well that they'll use the maybe the nursing station that has a single stall bathroom in it as a, a gender neutral bathroom where a transgender person, especially a young person that feels so may feel so uncomfortable in school, can know that that's the bathroom that they can go to. So may or may not have a sign on it, but those are different things that I found um, just through research online and also through talking to organizations. There's a lot out there around gender neutral bathrooms. Great, thank you. Um, so this question happens to be specific to the VA system, and I really don't know where to direct the person, but the question is, where can a veteran receive help with surgery needs in the VA system? That is a great question, and it isn't one that I know a lot about at all, but I can say that um, if it's helpful, I can do some research on that, and maybe we can put that, on, send it out to the um, participants. Is that possible? Sure, yeah. yes. And in, in fact, that's a good point because one of the other questions is whether we plan to include the Q&A 
um, on the website. Mm. And yeah, we can take the if, if it's not too onerous, we can take the questions that were submitted from the lab, from the first uh, presentation of this webinar and this webinar, and we could see if perhaps we could put those out on the websites as well. If you're sure, yeah, that, that. I mean, I would definitely like to look into that resource as well and maybe get some more information because yeah. that's a great question. Great. Okay. Excellent. Um, so we have another comment, and it said that you mentioned homophobia as a barrier. Why not use homo slash bi slash transphobia instead? Uh, so that's a great question. I actually didn't use the term biphobia, which I should have used. Um, I used homophobia and I used transphobia. You'll see in the PowerPoint there's um, there's two Im images. One that says homophobia in healthcare is unhealthy, and the other says transphobia in healthcare is unhealthy. And I actually separated it out because I was in the beginning talking about lesbian, gay, and bisexual populations, and at the towards the end talking more about transgender populations. And I find that sometimes if you put it together, it might get a little confusing or conflated between the differences between homophobia and transphobia. So that's why I didn't use them both at the same time. And biphobia is similarly um, the fear of hatred and discrimination against people who identify as bisexual. So all of those terms are really important to use um, and I think important to kind of separate out sometimes just so you understand the differences between, between all of them. Hello? Nathan, are you there? Hello, can you hear me? I can hear you fine. I wonder yes. if this is Oh, oh yeah, you? I'm there. Yes. Okay, great. So um, I was just saying um, I'm very thankful for some of the people who have chimed in with responses to some of the earlier questions. So regarding the VA, um, Allison Royce Sinclair was saying that the VA does not do reassignment surgeries. And then Dana Beaven said that the VA will not do surgery, but they will provide um, HRT and supportive services, hormone, hormones. And then also Dana, again, said that she can send us the VA policy and can also talk to the Transgender Veterans Organization. They're on the web. And That's then, great. wow, tons of stuff is coming through. The other thing is, is that uh, Katusha O'Brien says, I work at the VA and on the STL, VAMC, LGBT Council, and... Um, knows at least in uh, St. Louis it must be transgender folks can have hormone therapy and mental health services but not surgery as of right now. The VA is currently working on reaching out to LGBT vets and protecting and serving that population but as of right now it varies from one medical center to the next. So wow that's a wealth of information just from those typing yeah. in so thank you very much. Appreciate that. That's great and then also uh, that also brings up we have um, at Calen Lord we have a transgender Care, uh, case manager, care coordinator, and that's a great thing to have at a health center or hospital because just from these questions alone, you can see that it's very difficult for transgender people to navigate health resources such as benefits, surgery resources, Medicare, Medicaid, all of that. So establishing someone that can help research that and just know, you know, how do you get your gender marker changed? How do you get surgery covered if possible? How do you get insurance to cover different things if, it's, if that can be done? is really important, and certainly there's not a lot, a ton of information out there, but at least someone can help give that information to the community. Great. Now, this is wonderful. Um, and so, um, Amy, you might be able to assist with this, and Nathan as well, but um, Alan, Allison Royce and Claire has a question. Has GLAMA or any other organizations working at, working, have they been working on health insurance carriers to provide having reassignment surgeries covered since it is now deemed medically necessary and not cosmetic? Um, I would I would say that I mean I'm not sure about Glamour, but I know that um, the Transgender Law Center and the Transgender Legal and Education Center, basically a lot of transgender places that work around law resources and legal resources, are working very hard on this particular issue, working with insurance companies to get things covered or to at least you know have better language around transgender care. I know that the, I don't know specifically the name of the place, but I know that there are some resources in California. Um, I forget the name of the insurance company, but I can look it up, that is actually has become inclusive for transgender surgery and transition-related hormones and, and is covering it. So anyone under this particular insurance company, which is a smaller insurance company, I know it's a lot harder with the larger insurance companies that often 
call this uh, cosmetic or called cosmetic procedures that they won't cover, which we know it is medically necessary, but not all insurance companies are on that. But the resources for Transgender Law Center and Transgender Legal and Education Center are really great to talk to because they are doing a lot of this legal work with insurance companies right now. Great. Thank you, Nathan. Um, so we have a question uh, from Carrie Kenst, and it is, how can we push healthcare organizations toward better data collection on sexual orientation and gender identity, as well as reporting on inequities in healthcare for LGBT populations, especially in the context of health reform? That's a very big question. So uh, I would say using some of the resources that I put out in the PowerPoint, like the Institute of Medicine report, what's great about the Institute of Medicine report is when it's, you know, the first time the Institute of Medicine is focusing on LGBT issues, but also it identifies the need for more research and data. So sometimes I find that if you're going to talk to people about, how, you know, doing research and data, you need something that shows that that research and data is important. So that's a resource that already exists that identifies how important that research and data is. And another way to push um, people on this around healthcare reform is talking about health disparities. So the IOM report also focuses on healthcare disparities. The, you know, Healthy People 2010 and 2020 also focus on healthcare disparities in the LGBT population. So sometimes when you can show that those healthcare disparities exist and show that there is a lack of research and a lack of data and show that that need exists, people will feel more um, apt to focus on that population. I find that some of the data that is included in this PowerPoint is why I wanted to include some of that sur some of the survey results shows these healthcare disparities and shows how many LGBT communities feel that there is no research on their health issues. Um, so presenting that information, presenting those numbers that do exist, really help in pushing people to do this kind of research and data and focusing on healthcare disparities, discrimination on this, uh, you know, the reports that already exist. I think that it's really important to use the resources that are already out there to help push people on it. Great. Thank you, Nathan. And I realize we're at the end of the 90 minutes, but I'm going to take one last question. And this question was from Siobhan Fitzgerald Cushing, and it um, is, has Cal and Lord thought of designing any kind of support system for people who move in and out of transitioning? Sure. So we have, um, you know, we have a lot of different uh, services that we provide at Cal Lord, and one of the services that we provide is, is mental health. So we do have um, support groups that exist at mental health and within a mental health department. We also have support groups that exist, or sort of like supportive care um, through our care coordinators, through our nursing department, and through sort of like the case conferencing. The, the conferencing we do interdisciplinary between our different providers, and that helps create kind of a holistic care for our patients. And regarding transition, the thing that I actually do is I work with when new patients are starting with us that are starting hormones for the first time, uh, they meet with me as a nurse uh, to talk about health issues regarding LGBT, sorry, regarding transgender care and hormones. Beyond the health issues, also connecting to what are the community resources they need, what are the support resources they need. And what I like about it is that it is not just about mental health, although mental health is incredibly important, but it's also focusing on the whole needs of the person, the health needs, mental health needs, the community needs, the resources and referrals they might need around transition in general. So they'll maybe be talking about hormones, maybe down the road they might be interested in surgery, maybe they're interested in changing their name, and I can work with that patient around how to support themselves through this. So really accessing whether they have any family or friend support, support groups they go, they go to, and connecting them to the resources that already exist in the community. And on our website now, on the Calumet website, we have a list, a very extensive list of transgender community resources around everything, like health, um, health issues, housing, mental health, substance abuse, all of that. And so that's something we can connect our patients to so they feel like they're a part of a larger network. We're also lucky to have the LGBT center right around the corner from us, and they do a lot of support groups. So they have support groups for transgender people that we connect people to. So we make sure that no patient is leaving Cal and Laura, transgender patient in particular, that doesn't feel like they are connected to support around transition, whether it be their first time, you know, they're in the beginning of transitioning, or they've transitioned for many years, they might still need those kinds of resources. 
great. Thank you, Nathan. So again, I'd like to thank Nathan as well as Amy Wilson Strongs for representing GLAMA. And stay tuned. Uh, we will be sending out information about the third in our four-part webinar series. About an hour after today's presentation, you will be receiving a follow-up email. We always provide a link to the webinar evaluation, so please complete that. We take that feedback and use it to create and improve quality webinars. So thank you for your time, and I hope you have a great rest of the afternoon.